I'm happy to do that on behalf of Kumar, but I thought uh, Professor Kumar uh, would do that. So um, let, let me let's switch our role then. Um, on behalf of Kumar, on behalf of the Fields Institute, I really would like to uh, uh, first of all thank uh, uh, um, uh, Dr. Otto for coming uh, to present a special uh, session of the uh, Fields Seminar, and uh, I'd like to thank all of you for joining the seminar. Um, study does not need any introduction in, in the field of evolution biology. Uh, everybody knows study. And uh, uh, I particularly like the book actually that I wrote in, uh, with Choi Dai. That's, that's been on my desk all the time. Mm -hmm. When I watch Choi make recommendation about the sampling for the, uh, uh, for the VOC, I was just laughing, say Troy just applied the exercise in his book uh, to this very important issue. So without any further ado, and again, I, I believe Sally does not need the introduction on the leading figure in the world in the field and uh, very glad to have her to, to share with us her insight and results on the variations of concern. Well, th thank you very much for the invitation and I'm really pleased to come and speak with a group. And I'll try and be fast enough that we can have a robust discussion at the end. Um, so let me just make sure everything is up and shared. And then just in case there's a chat. Okay. So um, as I th think everybody in this room has been involved in SARS-CoV-2, it's really an experience in modeling in real time and never before in my life has there been such a tight connection between modeling and policy um, decision making. Um, so it's been a very interesting year. I'm going to actually talk in split this talk in two parts because I think it's interesting to um, just describe what's been happening in BC in terms of the modeling group there and then I'm going to uh, move to the second um, act where I'll talk about the evolution of SARS-CoV-2 and models of its evolution. So let's start with Act 1. What have we been doing in BC? Well, you're all familiar with this timeline, but just in a BC perspective, um, at the beginning of the pandemic, British Columbia, like many provinces, had very little to no modeling capacity on staff, either in the Ministry of Health or the BC CDC or the Public Health Services Authority. And so early on in the pandemic, um, the BCCDC reached out to Dan Coombs and Carolyn Colleen for modeling support. And they became officially connected to the BCCDC data group meetings. And so they have access to some of the, the data that's not publicly released. And then Dan and Carolyn then turned around and launched the BC COVID-19 modeling group and reached out to academics across the um, province and mathematicians and statisticians outside of academia to provide support to BC in response to urgent requests for modeling. And then, of course, in, on March 11th, almost a year, just a little over a year ago, WHO declared a pandemic. So this BC COVID modeling group has 70 plus affiliated people. I mean, most of the time, there's about um, 15 to 20 of us that are regulars and that um, have been coming and talking about um, the models that are needed with respect to uh, policy. Um, and um, oftentimes we talk about what's the next, what's the next decision that's going to have to be made and what's the modeling that will need to support that decision. So it's very much looking forward and deciding what models are um, needed um, coming up. So just in terms of structure, what do we do? We've met twice weekly over the last year, um, reviewed relevant data and, and articles, um, had speakers come and, and teach us um, about immunology and various things, um, and presented new models for feedback from each other. And every once in a while, there can be a call for all hands on deck. We need help with answering this question, like what is gonna be the impact of opening school? And then we provide advice and that, um, that'll come back and I'll talk about that a little bit later, kind of through, through that connection that um, Dan and Carolyn have served on the BC CDC um, modeling team, the internal one. 
In addition, we've had a Slack channel, which has been a fantastic way of sharing new articles, um, new discoveries, um, questions like, do you have any estimates for this parameter? How long do um, people stay in the ICU? Those kind of questions, the Slack channel has been really great for both communications and community building. So um, just as a uh, quick examples of some of these um, um, events that have happened over the last year in this group, we've, when we've had a number of our weeks focused on what's the transmission rate from youth, what are the asymptomatic rates in youth, and those kind of questions, because they're essential to the projections and to things like school closures. And so we've um, done kind of, um, scans of uh, the research articles um, from time to time on that. Another example, of course, is trying to project when, <laughs> when we'll reach a um, herd immunity and um, the various factors that will influence the, the turning around of the pandemic, such as heterogeneity in populations. We've had expert um, uh, presentations. The last one was on immunology and really teaching us about all of the various ways in which uh, the immune system is tackling um, the virus and the vaccines so, um, so that we can better model um, the vaccination rollout, for example. We've had early on, we had presentations on the likely role that aerosols play and the kind of Di um, the chance of infection as a function of the diameter of the par particle. We've also had um, real experts come and talk to us about different ways of different control measures that could be used. For example, olfactory testing. Um, Daniel Larimore came and spoke and it was really an, in it was an interesting um, presentation because um, changes to olfaction are very common, even in otherwise asymptomatic cases with um, about 80% of people noticing a change in their ability to smell. And yet this fever checks are very common, but fever is pretty rare, especially among children. So this is an interesting shift in how we would um, detect COVID cases. And he um, was showing how that screening um, can have a huge impact on case numbers. So across the, the modeling group, there are a number of different approaches taken from standard compartment epidemiological models, statistical models of varying sorts. There's these breakpoint models as well as regular regressions. Um, there's network-based models, spatially explicit agent-based models. And I think that's one of the strengths is, you know, I'll come at it with one kind of model and another person will come at a question with the different types of models. And then that gives us a real, more robust understanding of what the predictions are likely to be. And then this um, feeds fed up to um, the public health agency in BC. Uh, it also fed out through Twitter and, uh, and blogs to the public. And as I mentioned, a lot of times we were really trying to think about what are the policy related questions coming up and addressing those. Sometimes we just didn't have the information we needed. And so um, the theory was used to, to fit the data and estimate unknowns, such as the fraction of asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic cases or heterogeneity in behavior and filling in gaps about the biology. Oh, sorry, that, for that I meant, sometimes we don't know things. And so we use theory to say, well, across this range of possible parameters, across the range of possible asymptomatic fractions, what would happen? And so that gives us a better sense of the robustness of our predictions. And finally, using models to help fill in gaps. For example, Carolyn did work on estimating serial intervals and estimating selection pressures is another area. So um, just as some, I'm just gonna um, give a kind of sampling of the types of models that have come out of this uh, BC modeling group. Um, one of them, which will probably be familiar to you is for, uh, um, based on the modeling of Sean Anderson at all, a compartment model that allows for two classes of individuals, ones that are able um, 
are not able to distance and so are, are basically essential workers and others that remain active and then a more um, another group of individuals that are able to socially distance work from home etc and that compartment model has under lay a lot of the projections here in BC and in the Globe and Mail and other sources. One project that has been very interesting, uh, I think to me, has involved collaborators in the um, engineering school where um, they've, they approach this problem not as an epidemiological problem, but really as a um, feedback cycle between the pandemic itself and human responses and human behavior. And this feedback loop is something that um, that uh, a substantial body of theory has already been developed about how you better control um, uh, oscillations through improved feedback. So if you think of it instead of as this close of as this loop, how do we improve that loop to prevent uh, massive oscillations? What is the best design control features that will keep um, the spikes in cases coming down, but then also relax appropriately um, when the numbers are down um, and so that we can have kind of uh, a more modest control. And here in BC, I think effectively there is this type of control mechanism at work. It's just not very explicit, but when the cases spike enough, then there's increasing restrictions as we saw yesterday. But we can do better by thinking about this in the control theory framework. Uh, as I've already mentioned, um, one of the key questions last summer was um, what would the impact be on opening schools and how did that depend on whether or not youth were asymptomatic, the fraction that were asymptomatic, um, and the um, infectivity rates of those. And so we were you know, able to basically say only if we're in the conditions where youth are mainly asymptomatic down here, not green, but brown and they have low infectivity, solid, um, are we likely to see a, a very mild change in the numbers of cases? Otherwise they would contribute to a spike. More recently, we've looked at contact tracing and the efficacy of contact tracing. This is interesting. It's been working very well in British Columbia to keep cases number, case numbers down, but it only works when case numbers are already pretty low. And the reason for that um, is that there are fundamental limitations to the ability of contact tracing. Um, that one of them is they, there's a delay between when the first individual, your index case shows symptoms, and then there's a delay between when you're able to reach their contacts and tell them to stop moving. So you only prevent a fraction of those kind of onward cases. Um, and then, of course, you're only able to reach a fraction of their contacts, so there's not always 100% coverage of the contacts. And in this graph here, we illustrate what's the, uh, um, are the reproductive number that could be controlled by contact tracing and, it, and as a function of that coverage and the delay. And, I, and a key point here is it can, uh, contact tracing can really help um, control diseases um, as long as the R is not too large but um, only while the coverage is high. And the problem is that once, a pen, uh, once through a super spreading event or any um, temporal change, if ever the case numbers rise, the coverage was necessarily going to um, go down. And so this ends up causing a kind of bi-stable um, bi state where either you, um, contract tracing can keep um, contacts, contact, um, case numbers down low but if ever um, there is an event that causes a rise in cases, contact tracing coverage goes down and then it no longer is able to control the disease. Um, recently, of course, with variants and concerns over variants, there's some of the models that we did focused on how, um, how improved uh, sampling can drive down the number of, can um, help better control uh, COVID before, COVID variants before they go out of control. And this was just a graph showing 
that if compared to whole genome sequencing, um, where the sampling fraction was low, like 5% of individuals were sampled by whole genome sequencing, if we ramp that up to um, um, these assays PCR that are can be um, scaled up to thousands of samples, if we do that, then by the time we first detect a new variant, P B117 or P1, we're going to have a lot smaller numbers out in the community circulating than if we are only sampling a small fraction. And graphs like this helped make the case that we added, had to add a layer of um, uh, massive, sa massive sampling or typing of all individuals for, their, for whether or not they were variants. Uh, more recently, so this week, last week, we've been trying to um, estimate how fast B117 has been growing in the province and then trying to um, model the kind of race that's happening between the B117 spreading, uh, doubling pretty much every week over the last couple of months, and BC's um, vaccination rollout plan. And, and so the, you know, the question is really how bad is it going to get and are, is a vaccine, are the vaccines rolling out fast enough to, to quelch, um, squelch the predicted rise in cases. And so just as an example here, uh, the answer is no, the vaccine um, rollout schedule is not fast enough. Here would be the projections would be 117 spreading without vaccinations and what you can see. And we're talking about right now in the next month. Um, the, the dash lines here are the maximum number in hospital in BC ever with COVID. So this is the daily, um, the number in hospital and the number in ICU, the max that we've seen so far. And these dotted lines are the capacity. And so without vaccination over the next few weeks, we expect to see um, the hospital and ICU reaching capacity. Um, and shooting past the worst that we've seen so far. And even with vaccination coverage, we expect this spike. Um, so it, it nips it a little bit down, but you're not seeing a massive decline, um, basically because the vaccine rollout is too slow over the short-term timescale. Um, this is assuming 80% of individuals accept a vaccine and 80% of effect efficacy if they get vaccinated. And this is assuming 100% um, of individuals will accept a 90% efficacy, for example. What we do see is that the vaccinations are massively reducing de the death rate. And that's because of the focus on vaccinating the 90 and 80 plus age groups, which now the majority of individuals in the 90 plus age group have been vaccinated already. And that is causing deaths to um, not skyrocket. So vaccine rollout drives down deaths, but has little short-term effect on hospitalizations and ICU um, demand. Over the long term, so this won't happen. And as we knew it wouldn't happen because once this spike uh, was occurring, we predicted that BC would start their control measures to bring it down. And yesterday they did just um, increase control measures by closing down restaurants in, in restaurant seating or in bars and other measures like that are, are now restricted. But if those that didn't happen, what would the um, spikes look like? And this is the long term if we did nothing predictions, um, but just keeping with the control measures that we've been living with for the last couple of months. And again, you, you do see that vaccinations drive down these peaks, but they would, even the best case scenario would um, massively overwhelm the hospitals and ICU. And I should say that um, one question that Carolyn Colleen has really, or one um, um, issue that she's really been focusing on is how much better things can be if you don't just do an age-based rollout, but add to it um, essential workers and other individuals that are in the class that are still active and working. And just as a demonstration, if we add that essential worker vaccination, you really do see um, all of these peaks almost having because that active class, of course, is um, the, the one, the people that have to continue to work and have contacts are the ones most at risk of getting um, 
COVID in the short term of, over the next few months. So, so I'm going to wrap this first phase up. I just wanted to give you a sampling of what we've been doing in BC and how it's worked and what, um, and just some overall reflections on this first act. It's been an incredibly different and exhilarating way to do science. It's much more collaborative, focusing on public policy needs, learning um, together and tackling problems together. And I really thank Carolyn and Dan for um, pulling this team together. It's sometimes, but maybe uh, I think probably people who've been modeling in other provinces feel the same way. It's sometimes made a difference, maybe slightly, but oftentimes you, um, uh, it's really hard to know whether the models actually did it did have an influence. You know, and to be honest, I would say what's clear to me is that I know we've made a difference by having a team of people that were well versed and had crunched the numbers recently and were on top of the literature and were able to speak um, with the public either through Twitter or through um, news agencies. So there's been, you know, we've done, I've done lots of radio and TV and news interviews and it's partly because of being on this team where I felt like okay I, um, I've kept up and I think that that has made a huge difference. The connection with the internal BCCDC data group you know in hindsight it in some ways was a help to have that kind of inner connection and in some ways I, I wonder if it was maybe a hindrance and the reason for that is that we were not ever entirely embedded nor were we entirely independent. Um, and I think that this kind of intermediate um, um, zone that we filled um, in some ways um, had some weaknesses in that we weren't um, kind of making public reports, but rather trying to feed our results in through um, uh, our, the BCCDC modeling team. And the problem with that is we don't know if it, it can die you know, they can die a quick death if it doesn't go out of that team or if they're if it contradicts what other people say, whereas the independent um, uh, position um, um, would have allowed public reporting. And I have to say hats off to the Ontario Science Table. And I think that that's a really interesting when I talk about kind of the independent voice, I think the Auto Ontario Modeling Table um, uh, science advisory table has really um, shown us an interesting way that independent scientists can kind of have a parallel track that ensures that information gets out there. So anyway, that's my reflections on um, the data group in BC. So I'm going to um, just switch now to an entirely different um, part of the talk where I want to focus more on evolution. I'm an evolutionary biologist. That's my uh, passion and interest and understanding how SARS-CoV-2 has and will evolve is um, of enduring interest to me. And, you know, within weeks of the first report of a new respiratory illness in um, December 2019, scientists were already searching the genomes of this virus for any signs of adaptation. Um, following the host shift into humans. And as a result here is an, a, um, an illustration that I recently took out of next strain compiling um, information about uh, the genomes. There have been over 700,000 genomes of this virus now sequenced. We have never had ever as much information about evolution in real time as we do for SARS-CoV-2. Um, in case you don't recognize this, it's a radial tree. It's a phylogenetic tree showing relatedness. The um, shorter the branches between two points, the more similar those um, genomes are because of their relatedness by descent. And these radial, um, um, these um, radial concentric circles are different dates. And so here are individuals sampled from the present. These genomes were sampled more and more in the past. And you can see vaguely their um, descend from a common ancestor that um, uh, lived at around November, December of 2019. And that helps us know it wasn't really, it wasn't circulating in humans much before that time. Um, so you know, October, maybe, 
but certainly not um, uh, much earlier than that. The other thing you can see from this tree is just how rapidly it is evolving or changing what the number of sequence differences are between these. And the rate of substitution um, is uh, for an RNA virus relatively low. So it, it changes about once per genome every two weeks. And that's lower than the per, per base pair rate is lower than you'd expect based on flu and other viruses because of an error checking um, gene in the genome of SARS-CoV-2. The other thing you can see from this treatment, at least I can see it because I'm used to looking at these kind of trees, is it, it's pretty um, much a star-shaped phylogeny. That is, it's what you'd expect from exponential growth when there's not a lot of um, sweeps of a variant arising that's taking over the um, disease and growing out of control. So instead, you're seeing a pretty star-like phylogeny um, with lots of representation um, of old branches um, throughout the world with the only real signs of these kind of sweeps taking over are here, this is B117 and this is B1351. So there are signs of those kind of sweeps and taking over of the phylogeny in those cases. So what are the selective pressures acting on a virus like um, SARS-CoV-2? Well, there are a lot, and some of them have to do with shifting selection pressures as it went from an animal host into humans. There's selection pressures that happen and evolutionary processes that happen within the individual and then among individuals. Of course, we're very, very curious about the selection pressures that acted early on. Um, that's where we know very little. What we do know is that if we, of all of the coronaviruses that have been sampled, SARS-CoV-2 is most similar to one sampled from um, bats. Oops. Um, in particular, this, this Rolophus affinis sequence, but still it's not very closely related. Based on the um, substitution rate, the, um, the SARS-CoV-2 diverged from that particular sequence 40 to 70 years ago. So there's a huge gap in information. And that's to be expected because we really have very, very little sampling of coronaviruses from wild, um, wildlife. So we need to sample a lot more from bats and other animals in order to get the most close relative to SARS-CoV-2. Um, there was some um, initial debate about um, um, perhaps an intermediate host like a pangolin being more closely related just because it happened to have some, um, some commonalities in the um, receptor binding domain of spike. But um, I think that's just because this particular bat sequence um, has recombined away that particular region. So it's pretty divergent from SARS-CoV-2 in that particular region, but the rest of the genome is very similar. And just to reiterate that, it is, it is the bat sequence that is divergent in the variable loop region and is the likely product of recombination, acquiring a divergent variable loop from an as yet unsampled bat, SARS-CoV-2. Um, and again, this points to if we continue to have um, ramp up our sequencing from bats and other animals, we'd probably find um, more closely related sequences. So, so um, there's still a lot of uncertainty about that initial host shift and I don't have to spend any more time there uh, because we don't have the data to really unpack that. And I'm gonna change and talk now about um, selective processes, both um, somewhat within individuals and then among individuals. So uh, from those 700,000 genomes, we can map where the changes, changes are always happening. As I mentioned, every, every two weeks, we expect a change somewhere in the genome on average. And so these are, these changes are accumulating. Many of them will um, uh, harm the virus and be selected against, but some of them will be either neutral or positively selected. And the question is, how is it, does this matter? Has this made a, uh, an, a, an impact on the spread of the disease? Well, as of December of last year, there really wasn't much evidence of strong selection favoring a new variant. Um, 
there was, uh, as far as I um, was concerned, there was no claim of adaptive change in SARS-CoV-2 affecting the pandemic substantially, that is having a major effect on transmission or mortality. Um, that successfully rejected a null hypothesis that accounts for stochasticity, the kinds of really um, uh, huge jumps in number that we see um, either because of a founder event where the virus gets into a subpopulation that didn't have SARS-CoV-2 and then you get a little epidemic there and that causes enormous amount of stochasticity causing whatever variant happened to arise there to um, arrive to rise rapidly in frequency. Um, and, and that and shifting patterns of, um, of travel, for example, initially where there's a, um, many cases were coming from Asia and then shifting to many cases were coming from um, Europe can cause massive changes that seem to be repeated across the world, but really are just reflecting those stochastic patterns of disease spread over space and time. So I think that's one that that has to be on our null hypothesis is and that we have to be able to reject. And until December 2020, I, I, I argue that we haven't convincingly rejected um, that null hypothesis. The other point I would like to make is that because we're watching genomes around the world and watching where frequency changes are happening, um, we don't often correct for the multiple comparisons problem of how many sites are we looking at, how many places in the world are we watching, um, so that we have to be careful of um, false positive correlations that um, where we see a rise in a particular region associated with a particular variant if we haven't accounted for how much we're looking globally for such patterns. So that, that makes it a very difficult challenge to detect true changes um, to the pandemic from evolution of SARS-CoV-2. And as I mentioned, the phylogeny didn't show much evidence. It didn't show a change in shape as you'd predict from a significantly faster growing mutation. Um, but of course, uh, just because we hadn't seen it yet didn't mean it wasn't going to happen. Um, and so Troy Day and um, colleagues from France and I asked, um, took it uh, uh, kind of the opposite approach and said, what would, how would selection act on a disease like SARS-CoV-2? We developed a compartment model that was a little bit um, modified for SARS-CoV-2 by having an exposed but not infectious class, a pre-symptomatic class, an um, infectious class recovered, and asymptomatic class. And the questions, and we wanted to know how might um, selection act on variants that change these transition rates. So to do that, you basically model, you um, develop your set of equations for the non-variant, and then you introduce a variant, a viral um, mutation that alters um, the, the properties of the disease, any, of, any or all of these transition parameters and crunch the numbers. So we focused on um, uh, the phase when the number of susceptibles was large. We're still in this phase in BC where the number of susceptibles is large and the epidemic is not large enough to appreciably change S. So we can hold S constant and then just measure what is the um, rate of spread measured by the eigenvalue of the non-variant and the variant. And from that, we can calculate how selection, how the eigenvalue changes as we change the properties of the disease. And doing so um, gives you an equation that tells you, okay, the change in the growth rate, the eigenvalue, as we change any aspect of the genome of SARS-CoV-2, will change according to this equation, which has terms like this, which is how the mutation affects here, the transmission rate in the pre-symptomatic class. All of these delta terms are those um, changes in more, um, virulence, for example, or changes in the fraction of asymptomatic individuals. Then there's um, the right eigenvectors. Those are describing the fraction of the, of the virus that are in the different classes. For example, the fraction of the virus in the asymptomatic classes are just positive numbers. And then we have um, 
these terms are the um, left eigenvectors and they're basically saying how um, a virus in a particular class is contributing to the long-term growth of the disease. And so a, a class that's just about to die out um, will have a lower reproductive value. A very infectious class will have a high reproductive value. And from this, we can determine the um, signs of all of these terms and their, and their relative magnitudes. And even uh, accounting for uncertainty, for example, uncertainty in the fraction of asymptomatic cases, we can, we can see how that uncertainty will influence the um, predicted selection pressures. And, and this cartoon just illustrates how, how selection is predicted to act by translating this equation into red and green. Red are uh, rates predicted to go up. And classically, as with many infectious diseases, there's selection for increased transmission rates from each of these classes. That is particularly strong when there's a high fraction of susceptibles still remaining in the population. Conversely, all of these green rates are selected to go down and they, that makes sense. These um, transmission rates out of the infectious class are selected to go down to prolong the infection in those stages, including mortality. Mortality is selected to decrease, um, be selected to decrease um, to, um, can, to keep people alive that are, are infectious. But um, the magnitude of that force is teeny tiny. The selection strength on changes in mortality are really negligible in this case, because by the time that mortality happens in SARS-CoV-2, most individuals are no longer infectious. So this um, selection on the virus is um, um, very weak if, um, if present at all. But at any rate, it's worth emphasizing that um, selection would favor a reduced mortality rate, if anything, but that that's likely to be overwhelmed by the mutant effects on any of these other more strongly selected terms. Let's see, um, what else would I like to point out? Whether or not there's selection for more asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic infections depends. That was the one term where it was harder to determine the sign. There's selection for fewer asymptomatic um, infections if they, the transmission rate from them is lower as has subsequently been shown. So um, that suggests um, less evolution through the, less transition, transmission through the asymptomatic phase would be selectively favored um, based on um, those more recent observations. These are just simulations just illustrating that those predictions hold up, increased transmission, a mutation that increases transmission rate um, rises in frequency, one that reduces the fraction in the asymptomatic um, phase rises in frequency and so on. And uh, you know, I'm still, one aspect of this though is that evolutionary process dies out pretty soon after the disease dies out. And, and of course we, we have to have control measures, but one of the things that those control measures do um, is extend this period of evolution, allowing for uh, a higher accumulation of evolutionary change. But of course that has to be done because of the, the um, effects on hospital numbers and disease numbers, but it's something to keep in mind. Um, so that the social mitigation buys time for evolution, but it has to be done. Um, how virulence was predict is predicted to evolve is not, as I mentioned, from direct consequences, but through correlation byproducts of selection for increased transmission or another feature. And these simulations are just showing that if there is a correlation such that a mutation causes both higher transmission and higher virulence, then that can spread. Um, for example, if it causes a higher viral replication rate and more severe symptoms, but the opposite is also possible, would have also been possible that higher transmission, a mutation causes higher transmission and lower virulence. And that's possible if there was a shift in where the disease tended to occur. Um, in the nasal passages and less in the lungs, for example, that can cause this type of reduction in virulence. 
So, so those early models um, helped us just to um, kind of discuss with the world how selection might act on SARS-CoV-2. That the main evolutionary forces favor higher transmission and slower progression to symptoms. That's typically true when you model diseases and true here too. Virulence and recovery rates of infected class are nearly neutral with strong um, self-isolation and testing of healthcare workers, for example, because there's just not that many individuals that are transmitting from those phases anymore. Um, um, reducing selection on that on virulence. Uh, and so instead, virulence, if it evolves, is more likely to be a byproduct of selection and transmission. And then, so I said all of that was before December 2020. And then, of course, um, December 21st, we um, learn from Public Health England of a variant of concern, B117, that had increased in frequency over multiple weeks and across multiple health authorities. And it was just dumb luck that the tests that they were using happened to look at three places in the genome. And one of those three places um, was deleted in B117. And so rather than getting um, three positives in every test, they were often getting two positives in every um, test. And that's why they just had so much data from region after region, week after week, to demonstrate um, um, beyond a doubt that B117 was increasing transmission rates. So B117, what is it? It's an um, unusual um, uh, part of the phylogeny of SARS-CoV-2. And here I've, I've illustrated it. This is from um, Trevor Brad Bedford's um, uh, way of illustrating this. And this is the same phylogeny, the star-shaped thing I showed you before. But now the date is on the x-axis, and the y-axis is the number of mutations. And so you, you see that basically the number of mutations in the genome rises linearly over time as mutations accumulate. But B117 has this shift upwards in number of mutations. So it has almost twice as many mutations as you'd expect given when it appeared, um, causing a massive increase in number of mutations. It's characterized by 23 mutations, many of which are non-synonymous and um, including eight protein changing mutations in spike and another one in ORF um, 1AB that affects the um, NSP6 uh, gene um, within the cell that um, determines the rate of viral replication as well as um, viral clearance. So the problem with having so many mutations at once is we actually don't know which of these mutations or which combination of them is, is driving the rise in transmission rate. Um, the, different people have different opinions on that. Why this rise, so the other thing that you might see here, other data shows it more convincingly, is it's not that uh, within and among the B117, they're still rising at the same rate. So it's not a change in slope, it's like a change in intercept at some point. And that's consistent with mutations an input of mutations at one point, not a higher mutation rate. And Rambo et al. and the um, Public Health England report hypothesized that this rise, this kind of um, uh, rise in intercept, was potentially due to passage through an individual with a weakened immune system. We have a lot of information of, of, uh, about um, individuals with weakened immune systems, and they do um, undergo, they, because of the large viral population size, many rounds of mutation and selection, they do undergo kind of more, um, they accumulate more mutations per unit time in this way. And many of the characteristics seen for B117 are also seen in the genomes studied from individuals with weakened immune systems. So that's um, the working hypothesis about what caused that jump. And so that is a combination of mutations and selection processes within the individual um, led to the appearance of this new variant. This uh, graph comes from Volts et al. And it's basically taking that map that I showed you, the video um, of spread and turning that into what, what is the impact on um, the reproductive number for this new variant 
um, where there's a spike dropout relative to the old variant. And you can see here that time that week after week and place after place, the um, variant um, was increasing transmission by um, somewhere around 40 to 80 percent, depending on the model volts it all used. So this is an example where by and large B117 increases transmission rates, so it's selectively favored because of that. And as a side consequence, um, that mutation um, inc also increases mortality um, levels, unfortunately, by about 60 to 70%. That's, at, that's against the direction of selection acting on the virus, but as I mentioned, that's weak. And so this is just um, uh, um, a side consequence or a pleiotropic um, effect of the mechanisms by which B117 increases transmission. And we, as I mentioned, we still don't know exactly what that is. There's changes in the spike protein that it might uh, impact um, ability to get into the cells. And there's these changes on viral replication within cells, either which way um, uh, we suspect that there's that higher ability for the virus to invade and replicate is behind this higher transmission rate. Other variants of concern also um, arose in soon after B117 was announced, B1351 from South Africa was um, highlighted and P1 from Brazil. The, it's a little bit less clear, but both of them also show these kind of clusters, high um, increases in intercepts suggesting an imp a burst or an input of mutations, again, potentially through uh, uh, immunocompromised individual. But um, unlike B117, we don't have the same kind of um, repeated evidence in multiple districts of the rise in frequency of these two variants. So I think there's still uncertainty for example, here in Canada, about what the impact on R would be of these variants. P1 is now rising in frequency in British Columbia. It's, um, I think, now over 200 cases. Um, uh, so we, uh, but we need to monitor and determine how much of that are due to super spreader events and how much due to a rise in R. Here's that star phylogeny again, um, just illustrating these. Um, variants and how they kind of have more than expected number of mutations given their age, less so in this picture for South Africa. Um, and uh, I think I'll skip that and just go back to, and of course with B117 increasing transmission rates um, on the order 40 to 80%, the very it's control measures that we've had in Canada that have kept the non-variants under control aren't working to keep the variants under control, as I mentioned earlier. That doesn't mean we can't bend these steeper curves down. It just means that, that it's going to take more control efforts, uh, more proactive measures to bend these curves down. And we're going to have to, or um, we'll overwhelm hospitals. Um, and you're seeing that already in Ontario, and we're just starting to see that in BC. I think BC is a couple of weeks behind Ontario in these spikes, but very close. And of course, I don't have a crystal ball about how evolution will proceed um, in the face of the vaccine rollout, but that's the next big question, is how much evolutionary change are we going to see in the next year in response to the vaccines? And just, just to help us think about this here as a toy model, simplified down to just an SIR model, where we can think about escape mutants appearing by mutation so that there's non-mutant and then mutant um, viruses. And mutant viruses can then um, infect susceptible individuals, like, just like the non-mutant ones, but they can also have some chance of infecting um, um, immune individuals, re, um, resistant individuals, either naturally resistant or through vaccine um, rollout, um, in fact, or through vaccination. And so it's this additional route of infection that would give escape mutants their major selective boost. So again, um, infections, as long as they're a small fraction of the total population, we can just really focus on the dynamics of that class. and 
from that think a little bit more clearly about how evolution will proceed in um, when we have a substantial amount of vaccinated individuals. So first of all, when, before, if we don't have the escape mutant, um, then the rate of appearance of this escape mutant is exponentially distributed. And this is how long it will take one over mu beta si is um, the rate of appearance of this escape mutant. And then once it appears, we can compare the rate of spread of the old variant to the new variant and see that the main, and as I mentioned, the major change is this one. So that's where its selective advantage is coming from this ability for the um, novel mutation to infect resistant individuals. And this has a number of um, implications, policy implications. If we're, we don't have an escape mutant and what we're trying to do is prevent it from occurring, then um, we need to um, do everything we can to lower transmission rates, have effective control measures and keep beta down. We also need to reduce circulating cases as much as possible because that's um, the more cases we have, the more new infections, the more new mutations. And so that uh, um, is another reason why we need to have really, we can't just let the vaccination um, campaign roll out. We need to reduce circulating cases alongside it. And also we wanna vaccinate as many people as we can because whatever we can do to reduce S would also reduce this input rate. And so vaccinating with one dose is a really important strategy to um, reduce the um, appearance of escape mutants. But you kind of have the opposite. Um, once the escape mutant exists, then its major selective advantage is not coming from this arm, it's coming from this arm. And so there, once the escape mutant exists, you're, we need to try and reduce this rate of infection. And so that, um, on the one hand, um, the fewer cases there are, that'll be better. So reduce immunizing um, individuals will reduce the infectious class, that's good. But boosting resistance where possible, making, um, uh, for example, through two doses will be very important by reducing P the fraction of infections of those resistant individuals. Um, and again, persisting with public health measures, reducing beta helps across the board. But this issue of whether one dose is optimal, one dose is optimal in terms of converting as many people as we can from the S class, reducing um, case numbers. On the other hand, two dose regime is really important to prevent the spread of, um, of escape mutants especially if one dose is not um, as immunogenic as two doses. And the data on that are, um, uh, depends on which study you look at. The one dose is pretty effective and there's a, there, there's a rise over time in immune um, suppression ability of our vaccine, sorry, our, our um, disease suppression of the vaccines, but um, whether or not that's a, a big risk or not. So anyway, I just wanted to highlight the types of issues that are at play um, with respect to the evolution of um, escape mutants. All right, so um, just to end, uh, sadly, we currently here in BC are in a race between vaccine rollout and the spread of variants of concern. But unfortunately, as we've seen this week in BC and you have seen in Ontario, B117 is a much, much faster runner. And with that, sad note, I will end. <laughs> well, that's it. Well, thank you very much, uh, Sally. That was a very You're interesting welcome. talk. Um, I think there was a lot of uh, uh, content there, uh, that some of which we'll have to review again, I think, in the, yeah. in the recording. Uh, we're seeing the same, uh, I mean, it's like a replay of, of the same kind of questions and same kind of calculations we're doing here. Mm -hmm. uh, exactly the topical point of um, uh, the race between va vaccines and uh, other public health measures, strong yeah. public health measures that are needed to slow this down and bring it under control. And then the um, further danger that may look ahead of other variants <laughs> and how they will respond. Um, so these are all the same unknowns we're facing. So good to know we're all, <laughs> we have right. company anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm going to open it up for comments. I think Jonathan, you had a question or a comment that you would like to lead off? Uh, yeah, that was 
really interesting. Thank you so much. I have so many questions or comments that I don't know where to start, but I think the one that stuck, there's one in the chat, which you can decide yeah. whether to respond to, but the one that stuck with me is, is anybody working in sort of a more mechanistic approach to the virus? So you did this really nice analysis. Well, what's the effect of mortality? What's the effect of less right. asymptomatic? All those things are highly correlated, and in particular, yeah. the one that you highlighted of spending longer in the pre-symptomatic class seems like it would have so much. Is any is there any way to work on that? Is there enough understanding of the virus that you could think about modeling the replication rate or something? Well, the the most molecular modeling, and this is not my field, but the most has been about a, a attachment rates of spike to the AC2 receptor. But I would say, um, you know, that that. Um, and they have predicted particular mutations like N501Y, which is NB117, would be better at um, attaching to our receptors, our AC2 receptors. But it's a little bit like we have a molecular light on spike, but we don't actually have much of a molecular light on all of the other aspects. Like I mentioned this NSP6, I think that's going to turn out to be a, it's a deletion that's in common to all three of these variants of concern. It's not a very common deletion. So that's a smoking gun in my mind, that parallel evolution of the very same mutation, that that could be the really causative mutation, that, but we don't have a prediction for how NSP6 functions and what that deletion would do. So I don't know if that those, you'll have to invite an, uh, other guests in order <laughs> to get the modelers of, um, molecular functionality. Okay, thanks. I'm, I'm going to try not to monopolize you. So. Okay. I do want to just briefly, I do think that it's not very like obvious this issue about evolutionary um, change. If we stretch out the period of time, but reduce the number of cases, that that would lead to more evolution. But I think it's evolution is like an exponential growth process. It is. If you track the frequency of one type divided by the frequency of the other type, that odds ratio grows exponentially as a function of selection. And so it's it's the kind of cumulative, and, and with exponential growth, it's the cumulative nature of happening over and over and over, uh, over a long period of time. So the fact that you have a smaller population size doesn't actually matter all that much. If you stretch out time, you get for a given selection coefficient, much more evolutionary change. Okay, uh, let's go to David Dern, David. All right, thank, thanks for a nice talk, Sally. Um, just a, a quick, curious question. So you, I can see from your simple model that the uh, expected distribution of the time to the, um, the escape, mutant. Next escape mutant is exponential yeah. with mean one over mu beta si. Are there data that actually speak to that distribution uh, about what, you know, what, what is it really? Right. Um, well, you know, to some extent, I would also say with 20 million active cases and a 30,000 base pair genome, we have every single single base pair mutation already circulating on the planet. So, you know, if, so to some extent, um, I'm not sure it really is a waiting time game. It would be in a, in a particular region in Ontario or in BC, it might be a waiting time game. Um, so you are right to flag that as, uh, um, is this really um, true? In, uh, time will tell about um, these waiting time issues. I, in some respects, I think it's really curious that we didn't actually see much evolutionary change over the first whole year of this pandemic, despite the fact that it just had come from another um, animal into, into humans. So why after a whole year with, 100 million cases and all of a sudden we see these, these variants of concern. I think that's a really interesting question. And it may have something to do with, it, there was no single base pair mutation that had a major effect. And it was either a combination of mutations or this weird deletion that, um, that took the virus into a part of the kind of fitness, metaphorical fitness landscape where it was better able to transmit. Um, so I do think that 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 if so that that is a waiting time problem, um, but good question, David. 
Okay. Okay. Ben. Ben. Yeah. So actually, following up on that question, because that's something that I've wondered about, is is just is there a nice simple null model that you could try to reject about the chance of all of these escape, all of these interesting things coming along after we've already at at in quick succession after we've already had you know many yeah. millions of cumulative cases yes i i mean i i'm not sure um i think we can reject a um, a model of um where sars-cov-2 is um, appeared in humans on the side of a fitness slope because we would have seen uphill um, climbs. So I think it, oddly it was close to being on a local peak on the fitness surface. And that's why I think that there's that required this kind of bigger jump either through two mutations or a deletion or a set of mutations. So I don't know that that I, I think we can read um, um, we, because there really weren't that many rises in frequency. There was a couple, D614G rose in frequency, that's one of the mutations in Spike. But again, that was one of the ones where, is it rising in frequency because now we're allowing travel from Italy versus um, China. So um, I still think there's a little bit of doubt there. Um, yeah, so recently uh, a group has suggested that there's something changed to the selective surface that in late to 2020, the fitness surface changed. But I think that that's a, not a very parsimonious view because I don't think there's something that changed worldwide in December. Um, rather, I think it is um, we the, these rare cases of, of multi-step mutations it just took a while for them to appear. And when you have so many active cases, those really rare events of multi-step mutations are just more likely to happen. Yeah, it reminds me, I guess there's a, is it, uh, it might be Katya Cole has some models for influenza pandemics where things move on a, on a neutral surface for a while and oh, yeah. then get themselves into a new basin. Yeah, and you know, I, I think it's I think it's like that. I, um, but but then there's some small fraction, maybe really small fraction, of these like extreme event cases. So the mutations aren't constantly picking. Um, but again, the, the more cases you have, the more chances of those really rare events happening. And I Thank should you. also say say that so that we should be tracking really carefully and and immunocompromised patients and their treatment with SARS-CoV-2. But I'm sure there's also a lot of cases where they, where evolution of the virus happens within their bodies and it transmits worse and never gets out of them. So it's also a perfect storm. Thanks. Okay, next, uh, Michael Lee. Hi, Sally, thanks for the great talk. Yeah. So I'm just wondering if the one year assumption is a bit misleading given how it started in the UK probably in the summer. So could that be a bit misleading in the sense the way you're saying that you're seeing the B117 a year after you see the the one from you're right. Yeah. So um, I can't I can't remember exactly when B117 is now, but it's like July or August, right? Is when that first yeah. yeah. Right. But that's still that still is quite a bit later than in, later in the pandemic. So it wasn't like it appeared immediately and started to spread. And the other thing is that, you know, some people say, oh, it's N501Y, but N501Y has appeared repeatedly through the pandemic and hasn't um, risen in frequency. So it's not, it's not a single step mutation, um, but granted, you're right, that the, we, we see it only once it rises to high frequency, right, exactly. which means it appeared before we saw it. Exactly, yeah. Thanks. But still, the summer would put it six months in, eh? at least. At least, yeah. OK, so I don't see anyone else raising their hands right now. And unfortunately, I have to leave. Um, it, it's been a fantastic uh, talk, Sal, really. I think it's a chock full of content that we would want to review and think about. 
uh, and I wish you could stay later today. We're meeting science table and I'm sure the same things are going to be discussed. <laughs> yeah. Well, I do think that the, this going back to the first part, reflecting on what we need to do differently as scientists in Canada. Mm -hmm. You're, you're right about we're very lucky that uh, thanks to the leadership here, science table does have independence and the modeling table also has independence. Yes. Um, and so that's, that's uh, and, and it has been exercised on several locations. <laughs> so we're quite, quite fortunate for that. Once again, yeah. thanks very much. Thank and you. Let's, uh, let's stay in touch. Bye. Okay. Bye.